Welcome to the Symposium podcast of the Cheops Lustrum. I am Wilke Schellens from the Symposium Committee and this is Rewired. Today we're talking with Paul Chen about building methods and technologies of the future and the influence of AI on our environment. At the end of the interview, there was some time for other members of the committee to ask some interesting questions to Paul Chen. Uh, are you ready? I am ready, yes. Okay. Um, so, um, Paul Chen, can you explain something about who you are, uh, what your main area of focus is, um, just generally what you're concerned with? So, thank you, Wilke. My name is Paul Chan, and I'm the Professor of Design and Construction Management uh, in the Faculty of Architecture in the Built Environment in TU Delft. Uh, I moved to the Netherlands in March 2019. Um, and before that, I uh, lived in the UK for 22 years. Oh. Uh, but I, well, I grew up in Singapore, so I've got a really, uh, yeah, I'm, I've got quite an uprooted life, um, I guess. Um, so I was, my background is in construction management, uh, but a lot of my research tends to focus on people. So I tend to focus on the people side of managing projects. Uh, and in particular, a lot of my research is about how people deal with change whether that's social change, organizational change, or technological change. Okay, so um, like in the technical change, technical change kind of way, you mentioned in the presentation on the fourth industrial revolution um, that we should start seeing buildings as a part of like a bigger ecosystem. Um, how do you think this way of thinking would affect the building sector and how do you think it will affect the occup occupants of the buildings? So maybe let's begin with the fourth industrial revolution because maybe mm -hmm. some people have not really yeah. not really aware of this. But of course, the first industrial revolution was about the steam engine. Huh? So we started to realize that there is a lot of power that we can generate from that. Uh, and then that led us to kind of uh, move into factory production. Uh, so that was the assembly line. That's the second uh, revolution. Uh, and then afterwards, we started to use computers a lot more. So that's the uh, electronics and computerization became the third revolution. And the fourth revolution is really the cyber physical. So how do we kind of connect the virtual with the kind of physical world? Um, and therefore, everything has to be kind of connected, physical things with the internet. Uh, so that's yeah. the kind of internet of things. Uh, and that's why the ecosystem is really uh, very important. Uh, now, very often when we think about buildings, and I'm the chair of design and construction management, so we yeah. often kind of think of building singular buildings. But, uh, and of course, in architecture, you often get very nice architectural impressions. Uh, these are kind of artistic drawings that show how wonderful this building is going to be. But very often mm -hmm. that is uh, taken out of the context. And of course, no single building uh, stands alone. Uh, you always have to kind of, even in the rural areas, uh, buildings have to fit in within a landscape. Uh, so nowadays, I think it is really important to think about the kind of locational context uh, of where the building is situated. Uh, and buildings are also kind of connected with other buildings uh, in a neighborhood, in a district, uh, in a city, in a province, in a region, nationally, internationally. We start to look at uh, really buildings as just, you know, uh, one thing as part of a broader ecosystem. Now, what does that mean for the people who have to live in these uh, buildings? And of course, we live in these buildings uh, as residential apartments or houses, uh, but we also go to work. So these are also buildings. Uh, we also use services. So we might go to the hospital, for instance, or the library or whatever. And these are all buildings. Uh, and let us not forget that we have to travel from place to place. So buildings are connected also by the infrastructure. Uh, so again, now we start to see actually a network of things. Uh, and the fourth industrial revolution is just going to take that um, network a step further by saying, OK, what kinds of data can we actually get from these physical uh, artifacts? Uh, and you know, what, what does the data represent? Uh, and of course, there's so much we can do with data. Uh, there's a lot of data that is uh, present, but also a lot of data that we haven't thought about before. So I think that the 
industrial revolution, the fourth industrial revolution, we get us to start to think about uh, in what places do we connect up uh, with one another. Yeah. So you mentioned uh, the use of data in buildings that we have to um, look more into it. So you could see uh, buildings as more as a data mine, except of just um, just a regular building. But how do you think um, looking at it, looking at a building in this way would help the building sector? Well, I think that the building sector has always been through economic cycles. Uh, yeah. And unfortunately, with the current crisis, we always seem to have a lot of crises uh, <laughs> that's just, you know, that gets us into a dip. Uh, and so I think, you know, uh, uh, a lot of construction companies and of course, nowadays, what is a construction company? When we think of uh, construction, we always think of the building contractor, but it's more than that. I mean, nowadays, you also have a lot of computing power uh, mm -hmm. and you might also have computer scientists uh, who actually uh, do the code that uh, help us with the kind of uh, uh, computer aided designs. Uh, we have information modeling, for instance, building information modeling that can go not just to three dimensions, it can go up to even four dimensions to kind of include planning or even as many dimensions as we can kind of think about. Um, so how does this help the building sector? I think that uh, the building sector has for a long time tried to think about how do we actually become resilient in the economic cycles. And so I think that the old uh, way of, you know, I build a building and then I hand over the building to you. It's a bit like just handing over a product to you. I think that is just very short term. I think nowadays there's a lot of uh, sort of business opportunities also uh, in terms of trying to figure out how do I actually maintain these buildings? Uh, so there is this ratio. And of course, this ratio is not uh, the same for all cases, but I always say one to five to 200. So you spend one euro on design, you maybe spend five euros on construction, and then you spend 200 euros on the maintenance. Uh, now that ratio is just to give uh, an impression. Huh? So mm -hmm. different things have different ratio, but the point about that is that we actually spend a lot more in the operating of the building than in the design and construction. So I think that data will play a huge role. It's a bit like when you buy a mobile phone. If you buy a mobile phone, you always receive a lot of information about the mobile phone that nobody reads. Um, yeah. But in, in effect, we need a lot of that information so that we know how to actually operate the building uh, in a very kind of efficient, effective way. Uh, so I think that that's where data comes in. So if I give maybe two tangible examples. Mm -hmm. uh, so in the energy uh, uh, transition, for instance, nowadays, we all want to know how much we spend on our energy bills. Uh, also because we want to reduce the energy costs, but also we want to know whether we're wasting a lot of energy or not. Uh, because nowadays we are also aware of the climate change and the environmental agenda. And so I think that we are going to capture a lot of very interesting data on how we use the indoor environment uh, and whether we are actually overheating or not. So I think that this is really interesting. But the other example is materials. So if we think of uh, buildings as material banks, uh, I mean, mm -hmm. how many of us actually know what goes into a building? Now, of, of course, hopefully, uh, as students of architecture and building uh, engineering, I hope that we know a bit more than the general public. Uh, but these buildings uh, last a lifetime and hopefully we are not tearing down buildings and you know we're not just demolishing at the end of 50 years. Hopefully they stay longer than that. And of course in Europe, you see a lot of very old buildings. Uh, so what kind of materials are within these buildings? How can we get that data so that when, when it comes to maintaining the buildings or actually recovering some of these materials at the end uh, of its use, uh, we know actually what goes into the building. So I think data yeah. is going to play an important role in that. Do you think this would also like work for um, no small kills buildings, just people just owning a house? Because you can imagine this like would work very well for bigger buildings where someone can like look into it. OK, something has broken. OK, there's this plan and then we can look into it. But if it's just a house, I can imagine it being more difficult. Yeah, so this vision of actually knowing everything, 
yeah. is probably an ambition, an aspiration. Mm -hmm. And it's probably easier if you own a portfolio of buildings, you are correct. So yeah. if you are a housing association, uh, where you actually manage a portfolio of different apartments, then it does make sense huh? because then mm -hmm. you actually know what you own. Uh, if you are the municipality, uh, public authorities, uh, they have actually an advantage of trying to capture an inventory of what they have. But you are correct. Uh, would the single home house owner uh, be motivated by that? Uh, maybe not. Uh, but I guess somebody builds the house, right? And yeah. somebody probably doesn't build just one house. They maybe build a range of houses. Uh, it'd be very useful to capture this information. I think the information is somewhere. The question is whether mm -hmm. or not we have it in a kind of centralized uh, place. But let me give you an example of where I think this is really important. For instance, asbestos. So oh, yeah. now we know, for, for example, that asbestos is actually really hazardous. Now, wouldn't it be great to know where the asbestos is? Uh, yeah. You know, rather than to wait for demolishing something and then realizing that there is asbestos. And I'm sure that over time, we will be seduced by new technologies and new materials. But these new materials could also sometimes create a lot of hazards later on that we find out. And it would be really good to capture where they are. Yeah. You also mentioned uh, the cost, so one to five to 200. Do you think um, having the information more centralized, so not that everything is precisely known, but more a centralized system, um, do you think it would then, um, it would reduce the cost of the occupant, but would not increase the cost of the designing or the constructing? Well, the trouble with collecting data and uh, developing models is that mm. these are not cost free. Yeah. So somebody has to pay yeah. for the effort. And this is also a debate that I think we are still having. To what extent do we model everything accurately? And can we model everything accurately? And the answer is probably, you know, for some uh, 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 examples we can, and then for certain situations we can't. Uh, should it be centralized? Well, I use the word centralized, but mm -hmm. I don't imagine that we have a central organization. No, I was more thinking per companies. firm or per, yeah. yeah. But I mean, that is not beyond imagination. So for instance, we have uh, Google. Google yeah. is pretty centralized. Uh, and in fact, the scary part about Google is we have no idea what information they have about us. Uh, and of course, Google is, uh, you know, has a, a company called Sidewalks Lab. And they are the ones who are also engaged in master planning and urban planning. Um, yes. They started in a few cities in the US where they were trying to uh, capture through uh, Wi Fi hotspots in the cities uh, to figure out how people travel. And so they partner with companies like Uber. And so they actually have quite a lot of data about how the citizens are moving and therefore how we should uh, maybe think about spatial planning. Uh, they certainly uh, did the master plan for Toronto in Canada. Uh, and, you know, it was all these uh, really uh, nice technologies that they were mm -hmm. coming up with, like a raincoat for buildings. So oh. can we have uh, raincoats that can sense if it rains, then we put a raincoat over the buildings or pavements that can heat up so that when there's snow, it will melt the snow. I mean, these are kind of really interesting technological solutions, but in the end, the schemes were not approved because people were afraid that you have this centralized power uh, and what would companies like Google do with that uh, data and information about us. But I think returning back to your question, so I never imagined this centralized uh, repository. Mm -hmm. I, I guess one of the difficulties is that we still work in a life cycle so even the yeah. one to five to 200, we still work on design, then construction, and then the operations. And I think what we tend to do is we do the models and then we hand over and nobody actually checks back to see if the models were accurate, valid, whether or not we are really getting information from the operations. So I think maybe there's going to be a lot of new opportunities in terms of trying to check and verify whether the information in the models are accurate or not. I think this will take many years.
but at least we start the conversation now and this could be future work opportunities for students trying to find uh, employment in, in the sector, I guess. Yeah. Do you also think uh, there's data that shouldn't be collected for these models? That there's... Yeah, I think there is definitely a lot of ethical discussions around that. Mm -hmm. uh, so do we actually want uh, companies like Google to know precisely you know, our every movement? Um, and it really depends, and I think that is not a yes or no answer. So, mm -hmm. for instance, in the current COVID-19 uh, situation, one of the biggest questions that we have is how do we ensure people are socially and safely distancing? Uh, so I can see, of course, that some companies are now, uh, for instance, in London, the London Underground had created this digital twin. Uh, now, they probably created this digital twin over a long period of time, but then they realized, well, why don't we use this to figure out how people are moving so that we can then see whether safe distancing is a problem and mm -hmm. if it is, then we can intervene. So I think uh, data put in the right way, I think uh, used in the right way can, can always be beneficial. But of course, there are ethical concerns, uh, issues like privacy, for instance, uh, I think are still uh, huge areas for debate. Yeah, I think it's also because of course, when data collection actually in buildings, children could also be a big problem because the, they don't choose to live there. It's their parents' decision. So how yeah. do you? And, and I mean, do we really want to know what goes into a building and what happens yeah. if, if we find out that the the builders who built it uh, uh, did a lot of shortcuts and uh, you know they skimp on and then there are questions around liability. Um, but I think that actually we are moving towards uh, um, a period where everybody wants to know everything. Uh, yeah. And I think, you know, if we think about social media, you know, everything is out in the public domain. Uh, issues on ethical values, um, I'm not quite sure, but I think there are studies that have shown that there are intergenerational differences. So maybe some age groups uh, thing, oh, I don't really want my data to be shared. Uh, whereas I believe that at least in in a lot of studies, they, sh they suggest that younger people are maybe less worried. Uh, I think it also goes through cycles. So if we have, for instance, scandals with uh, Facebook, for example, you know, where we realize that they sell on the data to third parties, mm -hmm. then people become more uh, cautious. I think at the end of the day is do we feel that our data is commercially exploited and for reasons that we don't know? And I think that if that is the case, then I think you would get a resistant uh, force. Um, but generally, I think, you know, uh, and I do not think that we should move to a, a situation where data leads mm -hmm. to 100% uh, automation. So I don't yeah. think that that is, uh, that is a good idea either. Because I think what we should be doing, and I think Richard Sennett had also distinguished between the kind of the different types of smart cities, sir, and mm -hmm. that certain smart cities are constraining. So if I take the kind of uh, uh, the Toronto and the Sidewalks Lab uh, example, then the question is, okay, where is, what is this centralized power doing? Uh, that could be constraining because actually that's data dictatorship. That's, uh, you know, that a small, uh, usually a group of large companies actually mm -hmm. owning a lot of data that we don't know about. Um, and that constrains our actions. Whereas I think what we should be moving towards is what Senate calls the coordinating smart city. In other words, we use data to help us understand uh, where are the problems. And it starts a debate. And I think that that's uh, only good for civic society uh, because yeah. I think the trouble with uh, debates is that if we don't actually base debates on data and evidence, then I think we also have a problem with, uh, with, with society, right? So I think mm -hmm. having data can be quite a useful way if it highlights all the different uh, viewpoints in, in society, I guess. Okay, thank you. Um... OK, currently with Corona, a lot of people work from home. Do you think this uh, will change the way we will design a building forever with the life cycle and the data collection inside of a building uh, in mind? 
I think it's really difficult to predict what's going to happen in the future. Yeah. Uh, it's, you know, we don't have a crystal ball that tells us what is going to happen, but mm-hmm. we can maybe learn from history. So if we look at the pandemics of the past, then there have been so many pandemics and everybody refers back to the 1918 uh, Spanish flu. Uh, and that lasted for two years. And I think generally, if we look at the epidemiology, uh, I think that's what uh, epidemiologists are also suggesting that it will take a couple of years. Mm-hmm. Maybe things will be a bit quicker if they can uh, find a vaccine that works. Um, but again, I think, you know, discovering the vaccine is one thing. Uh, that development does not necessarily translate to distribution of vaccines. Uh, so I think, you know, uh, there's also a lead time for that. So I think at least for the next uh, year or two, I think there will there's going to be uh, waves coming in. Uh, we already see that in the Netherlands that, you know, in the first wave, the government was a bit stricter and, you know, with the restrictions. But now they realize that, you know, we cannot just lock ourselves at home. Uh, all the time. So there are some restrictions, but not as bad as uh, it, it was. And I think we will have to live with the virus, I think. Uh, will mm-hmm. we go back to the offices? I think in the short term, a lot of corporate uh, organizations are thinking, why do I need these offices? But what is really interesting is that at the end of the day, I think we are social uh, beings. And that, you know, there are so many things that is, is quite limiting if I just communicate via a Teams meeting, for instance. Um, I mean, sometimes you go to the office and it is through the informal conversations in the coffee pantry that you actually, uh, you know, get solutions very quickly. And it's much harder to kind of convey uh, very complex concepts over a kind of virtual medium. Uh, I mean, I'm also a teacher and sometimes (laughs) it is so much easier to just Uh, meet with the students and you can actually get through very difficult concepts more quickly. So I think that there's still going to be a place for uh, offices. Now, how are these offices going to be configured is really interesting. So we Mm -hmm. went through a period of time where we started to move into flexible offices, uh, office spaces. So these are open plan offices uh, with no uh, partitions necessarily. And interestingly, in the pandemic, we realized that these open plan offices are not flexible because because actually the most uh, desirable offices now are the ones that are very old fashioned now uh, with your own cubicle, your own room, because you can Mm -hmm. isolate. Uh, So I think that we're going to uh, start to see actually how are we going to design offices that are going to be resilient and yet allow uh, that kind of socialization to happen uh, in future? Um, another thing I would also say is that we, we are always uh, thinking about how do we deal with the, the virus right now. And I don't think we have enough conversations about how did the virus begin in the first place? And if we really go back to the origins of the virus, then I think we have a a role to play here because it's by developing the built environment that we destroy our ecosystems. Yeah, Uh, I think it's also something that is, there could be a virus like every five to 10 years if we continue this way. So that was also a thing. Do you, I think what you're saying, like a more isolation, but also social, but sorry, go on. (laughs) And I was going to say, just now we talked about the ecosystem and how buildings are connected. So Mm -hmm. this example is really clear that it is not just about offices, it's also about our homes. And a lot of people, actually, what we find now is that the people who are most affected by the lockdowns and virus are actually younger people for good reason, because the younger people have not a very high income, so they tend to be in very uh, small apartments. And if you, have, if you have to work from home, and let's say if you are also starting a family, it's actually really quite constraining. So I think that it is not just about the design of offices in future, but also the design of homes, right? Because increasingly we are going to uh, be working flexibly. 
um, I think flexible working is very useful only if you have the choice to do it. I think the lockdown yeah. has shown that if we are forced to do it, then actually it can add to a lot of anxiety and stress as well. OK, thank you. Uh, in an article you wrote about the uh, conflicts and compromise of the between social, environmental and economic sustainability of the heritage adaption, uh, they stated that we make buildings as much as a building makes us. It is therefore vital that the future research considers how social groups change over time with inevitable consequences for changes in designing and executing adaptions. In what way do you, uh, the change in social groups influence how heritage should be adapted and just how, um, how buildings should be designed? Yeah, this is a very interesting uh, uh, point, I think. And if I go back mm -hmm. to the pandemics again, uh, I was mm -hmm. having a conversation with a colleague and we were talking about Le Corbusier, who came up with oh, yeah. a machine for, learning, uh, for living. And the ideas was around the 1920s, 1930s. And I sort of just made this uh, remark. I'm sure there must be historical studies into this. But maybe Corbusier's ideas was actually a reaction of the pandemic oh. in 1918, 1920. That suddenly we realized that we need the machine for living. I mean, mm -hmm. it, it, you know, of course, when we read that, we think of modernism. But of course, uh, way back also in the late uh, 19th century, we were, we were, society was kind of grappling with uh, sort of health emergencies. We had cholera outbreaks, we had a lot of outbreaks of diseases. And when you move to very densely populated uh, cities, uh, then generally you get more Ill illnesses also. Uh, so I think that the built environment, I think you should never read the built environment as simply a technical object, that actually it changes over time. Our designs change over time. Our imaginations change over time. So after the Second World War, we suddenly see a lot of very high rise apartments being built because we needed to accommodate the population boom, right? Uh, so again, you know, is it natural to live in these apartments? Well, we have become more socialized to be able to live in these apartments. So I think actually, if you look at uh, our heritage, huh? so heritage buildings mm -hmm. are not just about the museums, but they are about all sorts of buildings, we can actually kind of figure out uh, how society changes over time. Now, I have a very amusing example to share with you. I used to live in Newcastle upon time in England, northeast of England. And in, in Newcastle, they have what they call the two ups and two downs. Uh, they are basically terrace houses where they split into uh, two apartments, two bedrooms upstairs and two bedrooms downstairs. Now, in these terrace houses, the toilet used to be at the back of the house, which meant that, you know, if you needed to take a shower or if you needed to release, relieve yourself, then you have to leave your house, get into the cold, and then uh, to use the toilet, right? And that is so inconvenient. But I'm sure our great grandparents used to do that. Huh? Uh, mm -hmm. and, and that also maybe explains why maybe in the past people never showered as frequently as they do today. Uh, whereas now, I think we take showers twice a day, sometimes three times a day. Why? Because the toilet is in our, uh, our warm houses. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they're even uh, en suite with our bedrooms. So it becomes actually much more, I mean, just tiny... Uh, changes in design, changes our social behavior. So that's why I, I think that uh, we need to kind of think about that. The other thing also is that uh, uh, there's also a stylistic issue. Uh, populations change over time. Uh, the Netherlands is definitely very welcoming to immigrants like myself. Uh, and I'm sure, you know, with the diversity, you also have diversity of taste that would invariably also kind of uh, uh, influence the designs of buildings. So I, I guess when I wrote that statement, I was trying to say that when we start to think about adaptation, we also mm -hmm. need to think about the stories of the people that actually live in these places that use the buildings, uh, because they also bring something to the shaping of the buildings, 
and the buildings also shape their everyday practices like taking showers. Okay, thank you very much. Um, what do you think is the most important thing students of today should know about these topics? And are there any other topics that we that you think we should gain more knowledge about? So there is a long list of topics that I would like <laughs> students to uh, take into consideration. But mm -hmm. since we are actually speaking from a technical university point of view, mm -hmm. I think a lot of students of te te uh, technical universities are always very impressed by the new technologies. What I would say is that the new technologies, uh, and in fact recently I gave a talk, and my conclusion is that the new technologies are not the answers to the problems, mm -hmm. but they should be treated as the questions for our problems. So, you know, new technologies like new data science, uh, new ways of uh, kind of modeling, I think they should help us raise questions that we never raised before. Uh, questions about the way we live, questions about the way we interact with the built environment. Uh, and, and so what I would like students to kind of think about is what are the technologies used for? And very often, I think technical university students are always thinking that technology is the answer, but I think actually it raises more questions than they provide answers for. So that's maybe what I want to leave you with on that note. Okay, um, yeah. Um, can I ask a, a question actually before I stop recording? Maybe it's interesting. Okay, uh, sure. I was, okay. uh, it was very interesting. I was wondering if you, uh, what kind of, uh, are you working on any projects right now with your students maybe or uh, outside so, of that? Yeah, so um, of course I supervise some thesis students and at the moment uh, uh, there are a couple of projects that the students are very interested in. For instance, in circular circularity, uh, for example. Uh, and the question there that we're thinking of is actually what are the organizational changes that yeah. need to happen? And they're not usually within the organization, but in the ecosystem of organizations. Mm -hmm. huh? Because uh, if we think of energy use or material use, I think we shouldn't just think about the construction sector alone. Because, for instance, you know, if we want to think about the energy mix, then maybe we need to think about it from a district point of view. Uh, so, you know, if we don't want to waste the heat, maybe the heat can actually be recycled and reused for agriculture. So increasingly, we need to kind of work in an interdisciplinary cross sector way. Uh, so that's that's the project uh, that some of my students are looking at. But linked to that, I've also just started a funded research project by the Dutch fund funding <laughs> agency. And that project is called Stepping Out. And the idea is that in urban transformations, we need to step outside of our comfort zone and work with different professionals, work with citizens, work also with academics. So how do we step outside of our knowledge bubble and actually learn about each other? Uh, because I get a feeling that what tends to happen is that we bring different disciplines together and they cooperate, but they still think in their disciplinary silos. Uh, when actually what we should be doing is to get the different disciplines to debate and say, well, what kind of questions should we be asking? So with uh, Hafenstadt in Amsterdam and the Rotterdam Makers District, uh, mm -hmm. we're going to have over the next five years, this wonderful research project to try to help uh, support people to step outside of their of their comfort zone. So I'm really in favor of stepping out. I mean, I started my education uh, at least in construction, but because I study people, uh, I have to also understand sociology. So I also read uh, sort of uh, the social sciences. So I think in my career, I've also stepped out a bit, uh, I yes. guess. Yeah, yeah so that is the project. Uh, another student is also looking at office spaces and COVID. So I think this is going to be a very hot topic uh, for at least the next year or two, I guess. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, very interesting. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much for uh, recording this podcast with us.
Thank you, Paul Chen, for recording this podcast with us. And to the audience, thank you for listening. Tomorrow, we will talk to Lindsay McCann on the subject of sense of place and involving members of a community into building projects. For listeners who missed the previous upload, last podcast, we talked to Philip Samin about his projects that were built on Antarctica. This is available on our channel on Spotify, YouTube, and SoundCloud.